So let's dive right into our first topic, which is about understanding the fascinating life cycle of the silkworm and its transformation from a tiny larva to a beautiful silk moth. Now, this might sound like something straight out of a science fiction movie, but trust me, it's all very real and incredibly fascinating. Our journey begins with the eggs laid by the female silk moth. Each tiny egg, about the size of a pinhead, hatches into a larva, also known as a silkworm. Huh. Now these are not your typical worms. Just, these are voracious eaters, munching away on nothing but mulberry leaves. In fact, they consume so much that they increase their body size almost 10,000 times in just a month. Talk about a growth spurt, right? After this month of endless munching, the silkworm is ready to start spinning its cocoon. And this, my friends, is where the magic really happens. The silkworm produces a thread from its salivary glands, which hardens when it comes in contact with air. It twists and turns, creating a cocoon around itself with this thread. This cocoon acts as a protective shell where the silkworm will undergo its transformation. Now wait for it. Inside this cocoon, the silkworm is not just sitting idle. It's undergoing a mind-boggling process called metamorphosis. <sighs> Over a period of two weeks, the plump silkworm transforms into a moth. Yeah, you heard it right, a moth. Finally, the silk moth breaks free from its cocoon, ready to begin the cycle all over again, starting with laying eggs. And that, folks, is the incredible journey of a silkworm. From a tiny helpless egg to a beautiful moth, it's a tale of transformation and survival, and it's happening right under our noses in the world of silkworms. Now that we've gotten a good grasp of the silkworm's life cycle, let's move on to the next intriguing chapter of our journey. We're going to learn about the process of silk production. It's a tale that stretches from the spinning of the silkworm's cocoon to the extraction of this luxurious fabric. The process begins when the silkworm, after a hefty diet of mulberry leaves, starts spinning a cocoon around itself. This is no ordinary thread, but a continuous, smooth filament of silk. It's produced by the salivary glands of the silkworm and hardens on exposure to air. The silkworm tirelessly works for several days, turning in figure eight patterns to create a cocoon made of up to 900 meters of this silk thread. That's equivalent to the length of about 10 football fields. Once the cocoon is complete, it's time for the silk extraction. But extracting silk is a delicate process that requires both careful handling and a keen understanding of timing. The cocoons are first soaked in hot water or exposed to steam. This not only makes the silk easier to unravel, but also kills the pupa inside, preventing it from breaking the cocoon and the silk thread as it transforms into a moth. The process of unwinding the thread from the cocoon is known as reeling. The silk threads from several cocoons are combined together to form a single, stronger thread. This thread is then twisted, creating a silk yarn that's ready to be dyed and woven into the luxurious silk fabric we all know and love. But here's something to ponder. Each tiny cocoon can give us almost a kilometer of silk thread yet it takes about 2,500 silkworms to produce just a single pound of raw silk. It's no wonder silk is often referred to as the queen of textiles. It's a labor-intensive process that truly showcases the unparalleled beauty and intricacy of nature. All right, folks, let's turn the pages of history and visit the ancient civilizations of China and India. These nations hold an especially rich heritage when it comes to the production of silk and the rearing of silkworms. The story of silk is not just about a fabric. It's a narrative woven through the annals of time 
shaping cultures, influencing trade, and even sparking wars. Let's begin with China. It's believed that the art of sericulture, the rearing of silkworms for silk production, began in China almost 5,000 years ago. <sighs> That's right. The story goes that the Empress Lazy discovered silk when a cocoon fell into her tea. And as she tried to remove it, she found this silk thread. This discovery was initially kept a closely guarded secret, with silk becoming a symbol of power and status, worn only by the royals. Fast forward a few centuries, and the secret of silk made its way along the famous Silk Road, an ancient network of trade routes connecting the East and the West. This opened up trade, cultural exchanges, and also led to silk becoming a highly sought after luxury item across continents. Now, let's hop over to India. In India, silk has a deep-rooted cultural significance. Silk saris, for instance, are considered traditional attire for major celebrations. The country is also known for its unique silk varieties, like the golden muga silk, the fine airy silk, and the shimmering tusar silk, each with its own tail tied to specific regions of the country. The story of silk, my friends, is a tale of discovery, secrecy, luxury, and cultural identity. From China's imperial courts to India's colorful festivities, the journey of this fabric is truly a testament to its timeless allure and value. It's not just a thread. It's a strand of our shared human history. So we've learned about the life cycle of silkworms, the process of silk production, and the historical significance of silk. But have you ever wondered what kind of environment silkworms need to thrive? Well, let's delve into that, shall we? First and foremost, silkworms are pretty picky eaters. They solely feed on the leaves of the mulberry tree. So the availability of mulberry trees is a, is a crucial factor for the successful rearing of soapworms. But it's not just about having the trees around. The quality of the leaves, free from pollution or pesticides, also plays a vital role in the health and the soap production of the worms. Next up, temperature. Silk worms prefer a warm and comfortable environment. The ideal temperature for the growth of silkworms is around 25 to 28 degrees Celsius. Too hot or too cold, and it could affect their health and ability to produce silk. Humidity is another factor to consider. A relative humidity of around 75 to 85 percent is considered ideal for silkworms. High humidity helps in the easy digestion of mulberry leaves and the smooth extrusion of the silk thread. And let's not forget about cleanliness. <clears throat> silkworms are susceptible to diseases, so their rearing place needs to be clean and free from foul odors. Lastly, they need a calm and quiet environment. Loud noises and disturbances can stress the silkworms, affecting their feeding and cocooning behavior. So, in a nutshell, if you're thinking about rearing silkworms, remember they need a diet of fresh, clean mulberry leaves, a warm and humid environment, a clean and peaceful surrounding. These critters might be small, but they sure do have their demands. <laughs> but then again, the result is the production of a beautiful, luxurious material that has captivated us for centuries. So I guess it's worth it. So we've journeyed through the life of a silkworm, witnessed the process of silk production, and understood the environmental factors necessary for their successful rearing. Now, let's talk about the impact of the silk industry on global trade and economy and the ethical considerations related to silk production. The silk industry 
is a major economic driver in many countries, particularly in Asia. China, being the largest silk producer, plays a significant role in the global silk market, followed by countries like India, Uzbekistan, and Thailand. The silk industry not only contributes to the GDP, but also provides employment to millions of people. From sericulture farming to weeding, dyeing, and trading, each step provides livelihood opportunities. The industry also boosts tourism, with visitors flocking to witness the fascinating process of silk production. Now, on to global trade. Silk, being a high-value commodity, significantly contributes to the trade balance of silk-producing countries. The Silk Road, a network of trade routes, anciently connected the East and West, facilitating the exchange of goods, technology, and cultures, with silk being a primary trade item. But while discussing the economic impact, we mustn't overlook the ethical considerations associated with silk production. The traditional process of silk production often involves boiling the cocoons while the silkworms are still inside, which raises concerns about animal welfare. Fortunately, there's an alternative method known as ahimsa or peace silk, where silk is extracted after the moths have naturally emerged from their cocoons. However, this method is more time consuming and costly, resulting in higher prices for the end product. In the end, it's a balancing act between sustaining economies and respecting the life cycle of these tiny creatures that gift us this luxurious fabric. It's not just about a fabric, it's about the lives, both human and silkworms intertwined with it. And that, my friends, concludes our deep dive into the world of silkworms and silk production. It's a world where nature needs nurture, tradition needs trade, and ethics needs economics. <laughs>